Hello, everyone. Welcome to this first inaugural uh, Joint Royal Entomological Society and Royal Aeronautical Society talk on insects and aircraft. Um, my name is uh, Sohail Choktai. I'm vice chair of the Air Transport Group of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, and the inception for this collaboration actually started about a year ago uh, when I was working in um, eVTOL, electric aviation, um, and I became interested in uh, the relationship of bio biomimetics, actually, uh, uh, um, in respect of uh, insects to aviation. So I was looking at the aerodynamics of insects and the, um, uh, the autonomous capability of aircraft with respect to insect um, intelligence. Um, so I reached out to the Royal Entomological Society, hoping to establish uh, some links. And immediately Richard Harrington, um, who's our co-chair today, um, he responded. Um, Richard is the trustee and chair uh, of Meetings Committee, plus editor of our Antenna magazine. Um, we, we had a very long uh, discussion uh, over the space of quite a few months. Uh, and we spoke about uh, various types of collaboration that might be possible. Um, we were even looking at um, a, a bigger conference uh, on um, uh, birds and bees and bats, um, but we decided um, eventually to settle on a, a much smaller uh, first off event uh, to see how the relationship would go and whether there was any appetite for a, a larger event. Um, we have uh, two speakers representing each society today. Um, Dai uh, Whittingham uh, from the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, Dai is from the Flight Operations Group um, of the Society. And uh, we have Jason Chapman representing the Royal Entomological Society. Uh, and Jason is from Exeter University. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a uh, enjoying relationship between our two respective societies. Um, and so um, I think I'll, I'll if, you, if I may, just give you a brief introduction to the Royal Aeronautical Society uh, to start with. So, where we were founded in 1866, uh, we're the world's only professional body dedicated to the entire um, aerospace and aviation community. And we, um, one of our major themes is to disseminate knowledge. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways, which I'll go through um, as I go through the slides. Uh, we have associations with uh, 32 universities. Uh, we have 21 specialist interest groups. Uh, we, um, uh, we're, we're, we, we are um, uh, approved by the Engineering Council, uh, nominate uh, engineers and technicians, and we have 4,000 registered with the Engineering Council. And we have 67 branches worldwide, uh, in all total 25,000 plus members. And we do a lot of outreach activity with schools. Um, so we are a diverse uh, uh, and inclusive uh, group um, uh, within the society, and we encourage everyone to join us. Our priority themes at the moment are developing um, our young people. Uh, we, we're very interested in the future of flight. And we, um, we are very uh, um, uh, keen to develop our thinking on climate change and sustain sustainability. As I said earlier, uh, we, uh, we are very um, uh, active in uh, disseminating knowledge. And the way we do that is um, by way of um, what we're doing today, our conferences and events. Um, we've got our, we have a large conference program throughout the year. Um, and uh, we uh, use the headquarters building at Hamilton Place uh, for a lot, lot of those conferences. Um, this is a range of our specialist groups. 
uh, ranging from aerodynamics to weapon systems and technology. And as I mentioned, um, I'm from Air Transport and Dai is from the Flight Operations Group. But going forward, we're hoping to um, touch base with um, some of these groups uh, for further uh, relationship with the Royal Entomological Society, uh, where it does uh, um, uh, help in, in bringing us together. Um, we have uh, two magazines. Uh, the Aerospace Magazine goes out to the complete membership. Um, it's a general purpose, uh, a general knowledge uh, aerospace magazine. And we have a more technical um, journal, um, uh, which covers um, uh, things that might be of interest to um, uh, some of you out there who might be wanting to look at, for example, what aviation does in terms of biomimetics in the future. And we have a large uh, library at Flandre, National Aerospace Library at Flandre, and a large extensive collection of aerospace and um, aeronautical uh, journals and books. Uh, our membership is, um, uh, as I said, I started at university. I joined when I was a, uh, a student and I've stayed with the society my whole uh, journey through the aerospace sector. Um, professional registration, I've mentioned already with the Engineering Council. Um, we're very uh, um, uh, thankful to our corporate partners uh, who help us Im um, immensely. Uh, in the work that we do, um, and we always uh, try to encourage and uh, encourage them to take part in our activities, uh, conferences, and events included. And that's my um, presentation. Um, so um, I know that the Royal Entomological Society has a similar ethos. And um, I'll pass over to my um, res colleague, Richard Carrington, uh, to introduce uh, uh, the res, um, our speakers, and indeed chair this talk. And with this, I'll pass over to Richard. I hope you enjoy this evening, and I'll see you later at the end. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, So Hale. So I will now attempt to uh, share my screen and keep fingers crossed because we had just a little trouble earlier on. That looks very promising. So thank you, Sahel. That was a very nice uh, introduction to the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society. I'll try now to do the same for the Royal Entomological Society. We've undergone uh, a major transformation. We have a new look with these lovely iridescent colours. We have a new logo and far more important, we have a brand new strategy to see us through the next few years. And uh, all that was launched and my um, next picture is not coming up when I press forward. So I might have to ask uh, Luke to take over and show the screen. We had this trouble earlier. Are you able to take over, Luke? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Actually, Bianca might be quicker to it. Um, Bianca, are you there? I'm here, one second. Sorry, technical difficulties. While this is coming up, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, I'll carry on talking. Just um, to introduce, uh, give you a little bit of history. We we started life in um, 1833 as the Entomological Society of London. Let's get on to the next slide now, if you can do that. So that's lovely. So that's just a picture uh, of our launch event that happened in March uh, this year. So we started life in 1833 as the Entomological Society uh, of London. We were granted a royal charter by Queen Victoria in 1885, and then courtesy of George V, we were allowed to add the word royal to our name uh, in 1933. So we now have around uh, 1,700 members and growing. We're a much smaller society than the Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, about a third of our members are from overseas. Next slide. So here are a few uh, notable alumni. I'm sure you'll all uh, recognize Charles Darwin, top left there. 
uh, you may or may not uh, recognize Alfred Russell Wallace, top right, who independently proposed the uh, theory of evolution and natural selection. Then bottom left, we have one of our more famous uh, previous presidents, Dame Miriam Rothschild, sadly no longer with us, uh, but very much still with us. We're very proud to have Sir David Attenborough, who I'm sure you all recognize bottom right as one of our uh, honorary uh, fellows. Next slide. So this is our headquarters uh, in St Albans. We moved there in 2007, uh, having been in London prior to that at, uh, at Queen's Gate. So what do we do? Next slide. Well, first of all, several world-class meetings. Uh, we also have uh, special interest groups and we actually have one more than the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society. We have 22 special interest groups at the moment. Um, seven of them, just as examples, are shown along the top there. Um, we have an annual major conference called ENTO, which uh, this year is back in person as well as online in September, and that's going to be held in Lincoln. We have a very active student membership. They organize meetings, uh, an example of, of, a, of a virtual meeting bottom right there. And we do have uh, several meetings with other organizations and it's an absolute delight to uh, have this very first one with the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society uh, this evening. Uh, next. So the Society also engages in a wide range of uh, outreach activities. Principal amongst them is Insect Week, which has only just happened, 20th, 26th of June, uh, just recently. And this is an opportunity for events to be held all around the country uh, with a, a whole range of organisations to uh, draw the attention of the public to the importance of insects to our world and to, and to human beings. And, and there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of events around the country that week uh, explaining the importance of uh, insects. Next. We publish seven uh, scientific journals shown there as well as our quarterly colourful uh, bulletin to members and tenor. Next. And we also have a world-class uh, library that can be accessed uh, online or in person. I have to say it's rarely this crowded. I think this was a, a, a demonstration event with um, a, a university uh, present, but, but as well as uh, a whole range of very valuable old books and old documents. We do, of course, have all the up-to-date literature which our uh, members can access. Next. So jointly with the uh, Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, we own and manage uh, a, a nature reserve called Daneway Banks in Gloucestershire. Uh, this is not very far from uh, Prince Charles's uh, High Grove residence, and he does take uh, a, a lot of interest in Daneway. Uh, it's the home to a large number of insects, including some very rare ones, and including the uh, large blue butterfly, which went extinct from this country in 1979, but was reintroduced from Sweden in 1983. And uh, Jeremy, uh, Thomas, uh, one from the left there, a, a past president uh, of ours, is the scientist who was responsible uh, for that introduction. Next. So I was out on a walk um, a couple of weeks ago and I, I spotted this information board at what used to be the uh, de Havilland, uh, the Hatfield Airdrome that was home to the de Havilland uh, aircraft company from 1930 to 1960, uh, and then to Hawker Siddeley from 1960 to 1977, and from British, Air and British Aerospace from 1977 until its uh, closure in uh, 1993. And what caught my eye was that Geoffrey de Havilland was apparently a keen entomologist. And you can see on the right hand side of the board there, he, he named several of his aircraft uh, after insects. We've got the puss moth, the gypsy moth, the tiger moth, the mosquito. I'm not quite sure where the comet and the uh, harrier come in, but hornet, of course, uh, another insect. So insects and uh, aircraft clearly 
uh, have the same aficionados and people are interested in both. They have a lot in common. Uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, obviously the most, uh, <laughs> the clearest similarity is that they fly. So aerodynamics is an important issue. Some of them need camouflage, aircraft and insects. Some of them have attack mechanisms. Some of them have defense mechanisms. Uh, distance and speed are important considerations. Fuel is an important consideration, fuel efficiency. So we have here a picture of a tiger moth, uh, the garden tiger moth uh, on, on the Lepidoptera side. Um, and this, I hope, is a, a tiger moth plane to immediately show um, common ground here. So next slide, please. So, so there we are. So, Insects and planes clearly have a lot in common. There is an enormous amount that our two societies could discuss together. Uh, this evening, we are just covering uh, two topics, but later on, we'll have a poll, we'll have a discussion, and hopefully this will lead to uh, further uh, mutually useful collaborations between our uh, two societies. So we've got two talks this evening. Uh, one from first from Di Whittington, then from Jason Chapman. Um, there will then be a poll and a short break, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So the question and answer session will not come after each individual talk, but after they're both finished. So if you do have a question, please could you put it into the chat, and then we'll pick some up and ask the speakers to respond to them uh, a bit later. So. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Di Whittington. Um, Di, actually, I've just found out, had a first degree in, in zoology. So um, we, we have an immediate commonality there. He will know something about insects as a, as a result of that. Um, and Di is the Flight Operations Group uh, lead for the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society. He joined the RAF as a pilot in 1974, and he flew Phantoms uh, for seven years. Um, he later became the Air Component Commander for all UK flying operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and then Chair of the Military Aviation Regulation Group. His last formal military appointment, which ended in 2010, uh, was as deputy commander for the NATO Early Warning and Control Force. And he, in, in 2012, joined the UK uh, Flight Safety Committee as chief executive. And that is the post that he still holds. Now, I must say that in my entomological career, I never thought that I would be introducing somebody with those credentials, but it's my huge pleasure to do so and to hand over now to Di Whittington. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. <clears throat> and um, uh, I never thought I'd be addressing the Royal Entomological Society either. And by <clears throat> uh, just by coincidence, uh, not two weeks ago, um, I was over in Nailsworth in Gloucestershire and was reminded of a, a very happy field course there uh, with um, moth traps out in the woods and uh, all that. So um, uh, yes, a long interest. So um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do uh, is um, uh, in, a, in a second is share my screen, uh, but um, I, I did want to say that it's a, it's a real privilege to be part of this inaugural uh, collaborative meeting and collaboration in so many parts of our world has has never been more important. So hopefully you will be seeing my screen. So um, that's me and what I'm going to talk about um, uh, is up here. So wildlife management, insects and uh, basically what happens with them a little bit about distractions and unintended consequences uh, and also insecticides. So I'm gonna get the wildlife management and the insecticides piece out of. And I know talking to entomologists that talking about insecticides is not a good thing, but sometimes it's, yeah, you have to do it with aircraft. <clears throat> and, um, and you cannot do that 
without um, actually thinking about the sort of um, process that you're using, whether that's CO2, which is completely benign in terms of the aircraft structures, or some other uh, more aggressive chemicals, which uh, can have an impact on the aircraft that you are operating. So uh, there are very carefully controlled uh, products that you can use within aircraft, not just for the human health side of it, but also to avoid damaging to structures. Um, wildlife management, uh, you might not be aware, but the, uh, the good book from ICAO recommends that airports manage wildlife out to 13 kilometers from the airport datum. And that obviously includes birds, it includes foxes and anything else who care to name small mammals. And um, of course, insects and a lot of that relates to grass management and clearing out the under thatch. Uh, interestingly, at the start of the pandemic, we um, recommended uh, a small group of us wrote a document about the issues that the industry was likely to face drawing down and um, steady state and then ramping up again. And wildlife management and the need to keep it going was right up there. But of course, it was an easy target for savings. So most airports stopped doing it. And as we know, nature reports of back vacuum, so back it came. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and that's had some effects and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But the Clearing out the under thatch, particularly from the large areas of grass on airfields, uh, reduces the insect population, which reduces the bird population, which reduces the small mammal population and so on. And it's just that um, uh, full ecosystem. It, it does have a real impact on the number of birds. And of course, birds uh, have, um, if you'll pardon the pun, have a much greater impact on aircraft when the two of them meet. So uh, I'm going to talk about insects uh, and what happens with them, um, the blockages that can occur and particularly short circuits. So they can get into um, avionic systems, into micro switches and the like. And the next thing you've got is either a short or a failure of a circuit to make. Um, and I'll talk about distractions and consequences later on. So um, why am I showing you this? It's the Phantom, um, lovely airplane. And uh, the date there is significant, 70th December 75. Uh, and an aircraft from 41 Squadron flying at low level down a um, compass Silleth uh, at um, high speed. So 420 knots typically, so seven miles a minute. Uh, the aircraft was seen to start a gentle turn and the next thing is it had pitched up very violently and tumbled straight into the beach. And sadly, it killed both its occupants. So um, another of the same type. And uh, up there um, inside the circle, you can see the two pito probes. What, are, what is that for? Well, the I'm just going to see if I can get to my... Um, I can't. Um, oh, yes, I can. There it is. I want a spotlight. So here is uh, you've got two uh, probes. This lower one uh, ran into the field bellows system, and uh, what you can see uh, below that is the um, the big slab tailplane. Uh, so with all aircraft, and, it, and I'm going to do some basic aerodynamics. I'm bound to insult somebody. Some of you will know. Some of you may not. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm going to get the same thing uh, when Jason talks, so don't worry about it. So this field bellows system, with, with all aircraft, uh, you need a field system. So where you are not directly linked to the controls with cables, rods or whatever, and these are hydraulic flying controls, uh, you need some system of ensuring that whoever is flying it can understand. Just as it happens with your steering wheel on your car, you know when you're putting at high speed, when you're putting a lot of a force into that wheel, you're going to be turning quite hard. And similarly, it's much easier to move at slow speed. Those are the same effects that you want out of a flight control system. So this was a system with a bellows. So there's an open probe. Uh, the faster you go, the more air goes into it and it moves. Um, it, it basically makes the controls harder to operate. And this was added to with a, um, a bob weight system 
So as you load the aircraft up, bearing in mind this is a fighter, you're meant to be putting uh, acceleration onto it. So let's say positive G. Uh, when you put positive G onto it, it would uh, these bob weights would make it harder to put more on. In other words, you're not going to exceed the capability of what was happening. And, and it turns out that with, um, is it going to go back? With that aircraft, um, the bellows had become blocked. When they actually did the accident investigation, the, um, the remains of a bee were found in there. We don't know what sort of bee. Uh, DNA testing hadn't been invented back then. Uh, and I think when I finished my degree, they still hadn't sequenced the human genome. So it tells you how far long ago that was. So um, that's the sort of blockage that you will get. And I can't get rid of clear all my drawings. There we are. Now I can. Uh, so that's the sort of um, issue, and you'll be seeing this image again. Um, this is quite a recent one taken at Heathrow. So there's the um, the Phantom office, uh, a typical sort of 1960s fighter, lots of dials and clocks, most of it you didn't really look at. <clears throat> but just as a, as a nod to the um, title of this sequence, the big orange circle you can see in the top there is the radar repeater scope. Uh, the radar being run by the chap in the back seat. But what I want to do now is just take you down into the bottom left hand corner of this image. Uh, and there you can see a little gauge <coughs> which says stab trim, the uh, st uh, stabilizer trim. Uh, and typically before takeoff, that would be set to two divisions nose down. <coughs> That's only relevant when I tell you that the one that was found had a significant amount of nose up trim. So the blockage had led to this particular pilot uh, working out that he needed to trim upwards to maintain, uh, take, it takes the load off the stick, <clears throat> which means when you let go of it, the airplane carries on in the way it was pointed. Uh, he had developed a lot of trim, which was what the system was telling him, but obviously when that blockage cleared, away it went and he effectively was given full aft stick, which took him out of controlled flight. Um, and that was then. They would not have had time to react to that. But if you <clears throat> think back to that, that gauge is lurking in the bottom left hand corner and <clears throat> uh, the pilot would have been actually head height would have been up with that um, glass screen at the top of his, um, of his uh, instrument panel. Quite hard to see, <clears throat> excuse me, quite hard to see and quite hard to maintain. So um, what does all that do? Well, this is a diagram. There, there isn't going to be a test on this, by the way. Uh, this is a diagram of um, a Boeing. Uh, it's actually a Boeing 777. And you can see there, uh, center, right, pitots, static ports. Uh, the, the message from this is that they are all interconnected and they're all feeding into the flight control systems and into the uh, navigation systems. And you can see another version here. This is the Airbus, uh, where they are uh, providing uh, attitude, um, altitude, airspeed, um, and heading, and whatever. But, they, but certainly, attitude, uh, sorry, altitude and airspeed into these um, air data uh, reference units. And these are also feeding into the inertial reference units. This is all part of the flight control and navigation system of the aircraft. Uh, but I think you will sense from, if you'll pardon the pun, if you will, you will sense that when one of these probes goes down, there are some problems that you get as a result. The reason there are so many of them is because of the need for some sort of redundancy, but it does take a bit of working out when they go wrong. So <clears throat> um, roll back to last July. In fact, it was over the June-July period that these problems first uh, reappeared and this is where we had a lot of aircraft coming out of store and um, basically going back into ops. Uh, those had all been protected but because the wildlife management at Heathrow had drifted uh, there were a number of um, um, insects that were there which might not have been there in the same numbers previously. So this chap was found in a pitot probe um, he was seen to go in it. I'm saying he because he was causing trouble. 
uh, but a wall mason wasp. <clears throat> um, and there is a photograph on a triple uh, seven of a similar insect actually in the act of going into one of those probes. Uh, and you'll see, I, I hope in that image, the, the slight rainbow discoloration. Uh, and that is because these probes are heated. Uh, they go to quite high temperatures because they need to be able to maintain themselves ice free at minus 55, minus 60 degrees or whatever it happens to be, but right the way through the, uh, the normal flight regime. And um, if uh, if you're not still hearing me, if somebody could uh, let me know, um, Sahil or Richard, that would be good. Otherwise, I shall keep going. So, well, loud um, and clear. Loud and thank clear. you. Thank you very much. So the, uh, the 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 wasp that was seen going into that probe, uh, clearly they've removed the probe, and um, the remnants went off to our uh, friends at the National Natural History Museum via the. Uh, accident investigation branch, and um, uh, and that confirmed the identification of that particular species. On other occasions, they've been through the heating cycle, and um, and you you get a bit of um, charred remains, which are always uh, more challenging to identify. So um, that was the probe you saw earlier. That aircraft had been on the ramp at Heathrow for six days. And uh, when they eventually started trying to fly, uh, the cross check that goes on between the two pilots quite early on in the takeoff sequence uh, showed that neither of their um, airspeed indications were uh, moving away from zero as they should have been, because at that stage they were probably, or they should have been at around 70, 80 knots where everything's starting to come live, uh, nothing showing. So they stopped at slow speed, no damage done. Uh, clearly, had they got airborne, then they might have had different problems. Uh, one of the others, uh, so there was, there was a whole sequence of these that were found at the time. Uh, one of the other um, insects that was found was this um, rather lovely uh, hairy toothed small leaf cutter bee. Isn't that a fantastic name for, a, for an animal? It's lovely. Uh, so, uh, so these were busy as well. Typically, the potter um, and um, uh, what's it, wasps, the uh, solitary bees, uh, always a problem because uh, you have basically built a very Gucci insect hotel uh, with a, a nice shiny waterproof covering. So uh, very attractive till somebody turns the heating on it. <laughs> so um, mitigations for that. Uh, this is an A350. Uh, and you can see the orange tags. So those are the remove before flight tags because those probes and sensors are covered. <clears throat> and if you look um, just above that central band of flags um, next to the Airbus logo, uh, the red hatch line, that's actually the static vent. Uh, those again um, have holes through to the back. And again, uh, insects have been known to get into those to lay eggs. <clears throat> so. Uh, and cause blockages. So the, the reason you have PITO and static is to be able to compare so that you, you can always measure between the, um, the free air outside and actually the dynamic stuff that's coming into you as a result of airspeed. Um, <clears throat> the problem, of course, with those probes uh, and with those covers, as you can, I've tried to indicate here, this is an A380. And from that upper set, it's about three and a half meters to the ground. So this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, it's not an easy thing to fit. And strangely enough, even with those flags, uh, they have been known to be left on. So this is some of the unintended consequences. The operators at Heathrow and most of the early stuff um, you will probably have heard was a, a rather large and blue liveried airline at, uh, at Heathrow, instituted a, a new sequence of checks um, and instructions so that where aircraft were staying on the ground for any length of time, then they had these covers fitted. Uh, if you leave those covers fitted, firstly, you get no information, but also for the engineers, um, as Sahil will know well, I'm sure uh, you basically melt this rubber onto rubber compound onto the probes and it is a nightmare to get off you basically 
uh, throw the probe away. Um, it's not good. So um, wh why does all that matter? Why, why should it matter? Well, the, um, those are the four forces, thrust, lift, drag, and weight that act on all things in flight, whether they are aircraft or not. And the classic lift formula for normal stuff, um, slightly different for supersonics, but that's not insects, is um, the coefficient of lift. Don't worry about that. The air density, then this V squared, which is the velocity, S speed, in other words, and S is the wing area. And you can change how much lift you get uh, to match the weight by uh, altering the coefficient of lift and particularly the speed. Uh, so if you don't know what your speed is, because some nice uh, leaf cutter B has um, decided to block your pitot probes, then uh, you are in some difficulties. And of course, uh, with momentum also being a V squared function, that affects things like stopping distances. So you, you calculate on every takeoff, there will be a calculation as to how much thrust you need to get airborne and the speed at which you can be going and still stop if you need to in the remaining runway available, typically if you lose um, an engine. And if, but if you're making a normal approach and landing, again, you calculate the stopping distance and it does vary with, uh, with wind, it varies with the surface conditions and so on. But um, that V squared function, that is the bit that will really get you. And of course, that's the bit that puts all the energy into the wheels. So uh, at some stage, if you try and stop too quickly, uh, you end up with um, the fusible plugs going and the tires deflating. And then the next airplane behind you is going to land somewhere else or you get a brake fire or whatever. So um, that's why we need this going into the system, this uh, speed sensing. But the other bit is um, flight controls. So with all the modern fly-by-wire aircraft, the, uh, the rate of response you get out of the uh, electronic systems will depend on the speed that's fed into it. And uh, for something like an Airbus, um, it has a normal law, which is the full up, all singing, all dancing, all nice and smooth. And it, it does this, exactly the same thing as the field bellows on that old Phantom, in as much as it gives the pilot uh, a, a feedback, a response that's proportional to the speed so that he's not going to, or she is not going to overstress the airframe. Uh, and those then get wound back for various, um, it, it degrades gracefully, basically. Uh, and you will end up ultimately in direct law where you have, a, as the name implies, you have a much more uh, direct relationship with the aircraft. It is harder, harder to fly. So <clears throat> that's all right. We've got. Uh, so I'll um, I'll just show you this uh, as you can see from the from NASA and um, uh, angle of attack. You can see over on the right hand side there they've called A and typically it's called Alpha. Uh, that's what the industry refers to it. Which is slightly ironic given the U.S. Um, academia's love of the Greek alphabet. Uh, but what I want you to take away from this are, are those two images on the the left and the fact that when you are stalled, the air behind you is very turbulent um, and that when you are not, the airflow is nicely attached. And the graph on the right is showing you that as you increase angle of attack, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, the amount of lift you generate will increase up until the point where the wing stalls. Uh, so, so you see that here, this is a, 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 a schematic, if you like, that the uh, at the right hand side, you're seeing a separated flow. Um, and as you come forward of that, there's a turbulent flow area uh, with a transition from that lovely, nice, smooth laminar flow. And the separation point is the critical thing here, because as that moves forward, it will get to the stage where the lift starts to really fall off and ultimately you stall. Now, this is valid not just for a wing. It's also valid for all the little blades that uh, make jet engines work. Uh, and you, if you think about those big fan blades that you see, those are very complex, but actually basically 
fairly simple aerofoil sections and they work like just like any other wing. So they are also vulnerable to stalls. They also have to control this separation point and the turbulent flow. And there are ways of doing that. We're not going to go into that now, but um, the difficulty for us as an industry, and uh, we were talking last week about sustainability and how important that is, but we have to be safe, is that the pressure to improve the efficiency of wings and um, engines so that they use less fuel, you go further, your um, holiday ticket is cheaper uh, and so on, that uh, you have this um, tension between the fact that they are very high performance. So damage, uh, they're not always as damage tolerant as you might think. And so you can have problems with surface contamination. And this is one of the areas where you may hear about ice and the need to de-ice aircraft. It's for just that reason, never mind the weight it adds, but it's, it's basically for the disruption to the, the airflow. <clears throat> so um, this is um, your original plague of locusts. Uh, this was a, an aircraft that flew into a swarm in Africa. And uh, as you can see, there is a fair amount of contamination, not damage as such, but um, you know, people are now thinking about special coatings. NASA has done some research into coatings that will allow um, insect residue to flow off the wing, uh, but they're difficult to manage and obviously not applicable everywhere in the world, uh, but they are also um, expensive and um, you don't, uh, and easily damaged. So um, there's the other side of it. You can see the engine on the right. And I mentioned that business with um, the performance of fan blades. <clears throat> but uh, over on the left there, you see some of the issues that the flight crew will have faced. The captain who sits on the left hand side has clearly managed to wipe a little bit of it off. Uh, and you can just see uh, the windscreen wiper there. There are windscreen wipers on airlines um, and a little washer bottle. but uh, it's not going to do the rest of it. So he's basically having to land this aircraft uh, through a um, uh, one of the little uh, little um, keyholes that he's managed to, um, to clear there. And you think about the number of people who have car accidents with failing to clear a windscreen properly uh, when it's iced up. So uh, landing that aircraft was going to be difficult for him or her. Uh, collision avoidance, how are you supposed to avoid collision. So you, um, uh, in, insects generally, if they are on windscreens, can appear like other airplanes, particularly for fighter types. And, uh, and a fighter, if you are um, working against another fighter type, you might be closing at somewhere between 15, 16 miles a minute. Uh, so <clears throat> at low level, even if you manage to um, skyline somebody, you're not going to be seeing them until maybe four or five miles, and they appear as a little dot. Um, so the flies, they can be really distracting. Uh, I also uh, remember well uh, being so distracted by a blue bottle that appeared in the cockpit of my airplane somewhere over Pit Lockery, where I, was, I still feel guilty about making all that noise, but it was a lovely day. Um, and a blue bottle that uh, I almost, almost opened the canopy to get rid of it. I just opened the window. Um, the canopy had a limit of 60 knots. Uh, I was doing 460 knots, so it wasn't going to stay attached very long. But that's the sort of distraction you get from these things. So I'm going to stop there. I've um, banged on for long enough, and uh, we will take questions at the end. The, the link there um, will take you to the AAIB report, which covers all this in great detail. It goes into some of the ecology as well, the environmental stuff with the impact of um, emissions, uh, particularly fuel emissions, on the local um, insect populations. Um, a really thorough treatment uh, of, I think it was five or six incidents over quite a short space of time um, out to one airport. And clearly it's happened elsewhere too. So uh, with that, I will stop sharing and hand you back to Richard.
Guy, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very, very much indeed. And my apologies for mispronouncing your name at the start. I'm sorry about that. I, I've been called worse, Richard, many <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah, entirely my fault. Anyway, so as yet, I can't see many questions coming up in the chat. So please, everybody, that uh, presentation must have provoked uh, a lot of thoughts and a lot of questions. Please do put them in the chat so that we can pick them up. Uh, and discuss them a little later on. Uh, but now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Chapman, um, who is currently at the College of uh, Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Exeter's Cornwall campus in, in Falmouth. And uh, prior to that, uh, he was a colleague of mine at uh, Rothamsted Research in Harpens and in Hertfordshire. And Jason is a true pioneer of studies in the evolution of animal migration and of the impacts of long distance movement uh, on uh, populations. And he's interested, he's very interested in birds as well as uh, insects uh, in this regard and to answer questions uh, in those areas. And Jason uses a range of uh, novel technologies in his work, including uh, biological radars, uh, weather radars, meteorological simulations, uh, tethered flight techniques, and uh, genomics approaches. And uh, today he's going to be talking, I think, mainly about radar, because clearly we have uh, a commonality here with uh, aircraft radar, obviously uh, used to uh, detect and monitor the movement of aircraft. But some of you may not be aware of the capabilities of radar in tracking the movement of insects. And Jason will now reveal all. Thank you, Jason. Right. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Richard, for the, the, the nice introduction. Uh, as Di said, I'm also very honoured to uh, to be able to speak to this uh, inaugural uh, joint meeting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, telling you a little bit about my research and uh, also hopefully to get some interesting questions from the audience. So um, I will just share my screen. Let's see if we can... Uh, Okay, hopefully you can see that and I'll start a slideshow and hopefully we're good to go. Uh, someone shout out if you if you can't see uh, my slides. Um, yeah, so can see. You, you can see yeah, them, great. Can see them fine. great, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, towards the end of Guy's talk, he, he mentioned some instances where aircraft had come into contact uh, with insects uh, while, while airborne up in, up in the atmosphere. And I know that, um, you know, it's something that the aeronautical industry is very concerned about is the potential for aircraft to collide, uh, to be damaged and, and potentially downed by, by biological uh, material that's in the sky, uh, in particular, uh, the larger animals, birds and bats. But uh, as we've heard, insects can also sometimes uh, cause some problems. What, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about um, insect migration in, in particular. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about birds, but this talk will be mostly about my work on insects. And we'll, we'll think about some questions such as, you know, what, what are the insects doing up there? Uh, why are they uh, flying so high above the ground? Uh, what kinds of insects are up there? How many of them are there? Uh, where are they going? Where are they coming from? And those kind of questions. So ho hopefully you will find that, that interesting. Um, and as Richard said, most of my talk will be uh, based around some of the things we've learned using uh, radar techniques uh, to study these movements. Okay, so um, it's really difficult to study uh, insect migration and also uh, this, this holds true for the migrations of, of small songbirds as well, because, you know, I'm sure you've all heard and seen uh, the results of uh, tracking studies where people have put satellite um, tags onto onto animals and track them but you know for the great majority of insects and actually for most songbirds uh, that's not possible because they're too small to carry the tags um, and as we will see uh, these groups m migrate mostly at, at quite high altitudes above the ground so we are talking about several hundred meters uh, some times up to several kilometers above the ground so so too high for us to to easily see them 
uh, especially because many of them migrate at night. So lots of insects do, and almost all songbirds migrate at night. So we're not able to, to track them visually. We're not able to track them by, by putting tags on them. Um, to make, make things more difficult as well, most of these species actually migrate as individuals. So, so although Di mentioned you know, swarms of locusts, and perhaps that's what you think about when you, when you hear the word insect migration, actually locusts are unusual in, in migrating in large swarms. The majority of species migrate as individuals, and so that, that also makes it very difficult uh, for us to study them. Okay. But aerial migrations are really important for, for a number of reasons, some of which I'll mention in a moment. So, so we, even though it's challenging, uh, we really do need to, to study their migration so that we can kind of understand uh, and predict and forecast their movements. So why, why is it important to do this? Well, the first reason is that um, some of the, the, the scale of these movements are, are absolutely enormous. So I'm just gonna uh, give a few quick examples here. Um, so for example, we have a, a moth that migrates to the UK each year, uh, known as the silver white moth. And this can be really abundant. So this single species of moth uh, can arrive in the UK in, in hundreds of millions of individuals. Um, and then the progeny will return south again to Europe, again in the hundreds of millions. So we're talking about you know, massive movements on, on an enormous scale. Uh, and if we, and I'll talk about this study in more detail later on, but if we think about all of the insects migrating above the UK, as you'll see, we are talking about trillions of individuals. So a trillion being a million million, that's a, an enormous amount of, of individuals and a, a huge biomass with thousands of tons of insects on the move. Um, bird migration also occurs, occurs on a huge scale as well. So a recent study showed that there were of the order of billions of songbirds migrating into the USA each spring and uh, billions obviously returning south again in the autumn. So these movements happening on a massive scale, uh, but even so they're, they're very difficult to observe and quantify uh, because as I said, uh, we, we can't see the individuals, they're flying too high often at night and we can't track them individually by, by putting tags on them. Um, other reasons why it's in interesting and important to study uh, insect migration is that, um, I mean, this might surprise some of you, but some of the uh, distances that they can travel are enormous. So um, two species that I work on, the, the painted lady butterfly and the globe skimmer dragonfly, uh, they're known to, to travel up to 4,000 kilometers within a, a single generation. And over the course of the year, uh, a multi-generational migration, they can travel distances of, of you know, more than 10, uh, to 15,000 kilometers. And if we were to scale uh, their movements uh, to their body size, uh, as this plot has done, we find that these, the insects that, that I'm talking about are the longest uh, migrants in the world. So this plot shows um, the number of body lengths traveled uh, against body mass. And you can see that those um, triangles that I've circled, those are all insects. So Insects are the greatest travelers uh, on the face of the planet in terms of the distance traveled uh, compared to their body size. And another reason uh, why we need to study insect migration uh, is because many uh, insect migrants are extremely important uh, pests, um, either of our crops, of our livestock, or um, of disease vectors uh, of human health concern. So, you know, some famous migratory groups include uh, locusts, uh, the sucking bugs like the aphids and plant hoppers that spread important uh, crop diseases. We have lots of um, pest moths such as armyworms and cutworms, uh, mosquitoes that uh, tra uh, transmit malaria, for example, are highly migratory, and so on. And so we really need to be able to study their movement so that we can uh, understand uh, where and when these insects are going to appear. Uh, we can uh, mitigate against uh, the damage that they will produce but also we can try to conserve those which provide beneficial services. Okay. So how do we study their movements, um, particularly these, these high flying insects? Well, the, the technique that I've used uh, during my research career is, is radar. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the, the sort of, you know, the basic ideas of radar um, emitting a, uh, a signal that uh, will intersect some target overhead uh, an echo is bounced back to the receiver, 
and then the information contained in that signal can be analyzed and um, information extracted. What, what surprises a lot of people is that, you know, this not only works for, for airplanes, but actually works for, for biological targets extremely well. But it, it shouldn't be surprising if you know anything about the fact that meteorologists use radar to study weather systems, because after all, weather systems are just uh, raindrops, you know, small particles of water in the air. And that's exactly what insect bodies are, just small particles of, of containing water. And so actually they provide very strong signals and, and um, we can use radar uh, very effectively um, to study their movements. Um, and some of the advantages of using radar for studying migration is that, um, you know, sometimes the radar infrastructure will already exist. Uh, for example, as we'll see, lots of countries have uh, networks of weather surveillance radars that we can repurpose uh, for, for studying animal movements. Um, they can run remotely and continuously so that, you know, they're, they're extremely good laboratory assistants, if you like, or field assistants, because they can just collect data day and night and never get tired. Uh, they can provide you very wide uh, spatial coverage and very good altitudinal coverage and work equally effectively during the day and the night. Um, some of the, the disadvantages of using radar is that, um, you know, if, if you can't get access to a an existing network, it, it might be very expensive, very complex technology to try to develop. Um, it's difficult to identify things to species level, um, but that can be uh, a, a, a benefit, actually, if you're just interested in, in, in trying to understand how much biomass is in the sky, but it, it can be difficult to do species level studies. Okay, so in, in my research career, I've used uh, various kinds of, of radars for studying migration. I've mostly uh, focused on the use of small um, purpose-built uh, biological radars. So these are radars that were developed specifically to study uh, animal movements. And um, on the left is the vertical looking insect monitoring radar um, that uh, was at Rothamsted for many years, in which I've uh, used for a very long time. Uh, and then the, the radar next to it is a, is a specialized bird detecting radar, which we currently have here at the University of Exeter in Cornwall. Um, but I've also, in collaboration with, with colleagues, um, also used data from uh, continental scale networks uh, of weather surveillance radar. So, so there are lots of um, radar techniques that we can use for studying uh, animal migrations. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit now about the, um, the vertical looking insect monitoring radars that, that, that I've been involved in, in using. Um, so these were developed uh, in the 1990s and from about um, 2000 onwards, uh, a number of systems were, were run uh, continuously uh, in, at various locations in um, southern UK, uh, particularly at Rothamsted, where, where I worked for so long, uh, as Richard said, um, and uh, we were able to, to collect data from these systems and use them to understand something about the high altitude insect movements that were happening uh, above the UK. Um, so how do these radars work? So as the name suggests, they're, they're a vertical pointing system. So they're not scanning around uh, and producing blips on a, on a PPI screen, as you, as you might have seen, uh, uh, for example, at, at, um, at an airport. Uh, this is sending uh, quite a thin pencil beam directly up into the sky. And then anything that passes directly overhead will be interrogated and send a signal back down uh, to the receiver dish. Um, and the algorithms that we developed were uh, are able to uh, classify those um, signals that we receive. Uh, first of all, they can distinguish uh, biological um, targets from non-biological targets. And then using various parameters such as the, uh, the size, the shape, the speed, the wing beating pattern, we can uh, classify uh, insects and non-insects, and then we, we look at the insect data in, in more detail. And then for every individual insect that the radar sees, we, we can get a, a wealth of information. So we can tell how high uh, above uh, the radar the, the insect was, was uh, detected. We can look, see its speed and direction of movement relative to the ground. Uh, we can get the body alignment, uh, which is the equivalent to the flight heading of the insect. So we can then compare its heading to its uh, direction of movement, which would be largely uh, related to the wind. And we can also get the, the body mass and the body shape of the uh, insect. So we can separate them into different categories. And then the diagram uh, shows 
the altitudes to which we can detect insects of various sizes, okay? And our radar system started recording at 150 meters above the ground, upwards to, to 1200 meters. So we're only looking at high flying insects, nothing below 150 meters. Uh, and what you can see is that um, very small insects, those weighing less than a milligram, uh, they would be invisible to us. So, so the aphids, for example, that, that Richard um, studied, that they were sadly too small for our radar to see. For anything weighing about 10 to 15 milligrams or above, uh, would be detectable throughout uh, the height range of our radar system. Okay. Um, in order to help us understand uh, what kinds of insects the radars were seeing, uh, we were able to make use of the extremely good quality data that came from the Rothamsted Insect Surveys networks of light traps and suction traps uh, from around the UK. Um, and that really helped us understand, you know, which kinds of migratory insects were present at different times of the year in the different geographical locations. So we could use that information to so-called ground truth our radar observations and start to identify uh, some of the major components of our radar detected fauna. Um, in, in other parts of the world, when we've worked overseas, we've supplemented the ground traps with these um, very bright upward pointing searchlight traps. The idea being that uh, these will draw down high flying nocturnal insects that will come down into the trap so that we get an even better idea of um, the identity of the insects which are airborne. But by far the best way to, to really be sure what species of insects are in the sky is, is to go up there and sample it. And, and we've done quite a lot of this uh, in the UK and also uh, various overseas locations using a, uh, a tethered blimp uh, that we would fly at um, heights of say two to 300 meters above the ground. Uh, with a small net uh, suspended below the blimp. And then we could um, sample the, uh, the fauna uh, flying uh, during the day and the night time to get a very clear idea of the kinds of insects that are present in the sky. And what we found is that um, in the UK, uh, the day flying insects uh, that were most abundant in, in Southern UK were mostly species that were associated, as you might expect, with uh, agriculture. So we have lots of pest aphids, for example, and then we also have lots of um, beneficial insects which prey on aphids. So things like uh, ladybirds and hoverflies and the parasitic wasps that attack the aphids, they're also very abundant in, in the samples. At nighttime, there's a, a completely different uh, insect fauna present. Um, we see uh, some aphid predators like lace wings. Uh, there's a brown lace wing illustrated there. Um, surprisingly, we also see quite a lot of aquatic insects, uh, but it seems that uh, things that live in ponds and streams uh, often fly around high at night, uh, on, especially on uh, moonlit nights, because they use uh, moonlight reflected on water to, to find new habitats. So we, we were rather surprised, um, but, but actually uh, it kind of made sense when we thought about it to catch many aquatic beetles and, and um, bugs. Um, and the other group that we catch at night, of course, are the moths. And uh, these include various migratory pest species, uh, such as diamondback moth and, and silver wire moth. Okay. So what, what does the, the pattern of insects in the sky uh, look like? Um, what, what I've got here is a, um, a time slice of approximately uh, 18 hours. Uh, running from midday one day on a, on a nice warm summer's day through to um, the morning of the following day. And uh, we are plotting the variation in insect abundance uh, with the warmer colours being more intense insect activity um, against altitude over that time slice. So um, running from about 200 metres up to a, a kilometre, you can see that um, during the daytime, there's a general decline uh, in the numbers of insects uh, with altitude, right? Um, so basically, the lower down you are, the more insects there are, and numbers tend to decline as you, as you go up into the sky. But the pattern is, is quite noisy and messy and complex, and that's because lots of these insects are basically being affected by the, the convection, the sort of thermals rising up and then falling down. So you get this sort of you know, very complicated, random, noisy pattern without much structure to it. Um, around uh, sunset, uh, about 8pm on this day, and also you can see it again at sunrise at about 4am, 
there are these really intense peaks of activity as insects take off at, at that time. Um, and during the, uh, the nighttime, what often happens is following this uh, sunset uh, takeoff at dusk, uh, you will get nocturnal insects continuing to fly throughout the night. But here we have a very different pattern where the insects tend to concentrate at a particular altitude. So on this night, all the insects were flying at about 600 meters above the ground in a very narrow altitudinal layer. So it was maybe only 50 to 100 meters uh, deep with all of the insects concentrated at that particular height. Um, and then they continue to fly till about one o'clock in the morning when it started to get too cold and they dropped out of the sky. And what we found is that um, these layers at nighttime are, are very common. Uh, most of the insects get concentrated into them and they tend to be in uh, what's called low level jets where the wind speed is, is fastest and the air is warmest. So in, in, in a way that's sort of analogous to, um, to, to pilots trying to get into the, the higher level jets, uh, into the jet streams and, and getting uh, tailwind assistance to help on their journey if they can, the nocturnal insects are basically doing the very same thing. They get into these air streams, which are uh, nice and warm, but also very fast moving. And, and while they're in those streams, they can travel uh, really great uh, distances uh, very quickly because the winds in these uh, jets are usually around about 15 meters per second, uh, maybe 50 to 60 kilometers an hour. That's much faster than the insects could fly under their own powered steam. So if they get into these jets, they can really bomb along and travel very great distances. Okay. So how many insects are up there in the sky? Um, that's what I'm going to spend a few moments now uh, talking about uh, a study uh, that we published um, about four or five years ago, where we um, estimated or quantified um, just how many insects were migrating in these um, higher altitude zones uh, above the southern UK. So, so what we did was we, we combined all, our, all of our data over a, a long term period of 10 years um, from our various radar locations, uh, from uh, suction trap samples and from our aerial netting samples. And we try to estimate just how many individuals and how much biomass was involved in movements over the course of a year um, in three different size categories of insects. So we, we quantify them as, as being either micro insects uh, weighing less than 10 milligrams, that's um, illustrated by, by the aphid at the top. And we had our so-called medium sized insects uh, indicated by the hoverfly. And our final category were the very large insects, um, our, our silver wine moths and, and butterflies and so on, okay. And, uh, we looked at uh, various uh, aspects of, of these movements, uh, one of them being uh, the altitude at which they fly above the ground. And what we found was that, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is that when we looked over very long time periods, we find that during the daytime, our insect density just basically decreases in a sort of steady fashion with, with altitude. Okay, so most of these insects are flying uh, lower down, closer to the ground. So the higher up you go, the less insects there would be. But that's not the case uh, at nighttime where we get this uh, peak happening usually around about three, four, 500 meters above the ground. So these nocturnal insects are not showing the same pattern. They concentrate into these layers um, where, that uh, coincide with these low level jets. Okay. And uh, these insects uh, travel quite fast uh, and in particular the nighttime insects tend to travel faster uh, than the daytime insects as you can see in those um, box plots there um, and that's because those nighttime insects are concentrating into those layers and so with average um, ground speeds of around 50 to 60 kilometers an hour uh, that means that these insects don't have to fly for very long to travel a very long distance so you know a flight time of four hours which if you remember that uh, plot I showed with the layer going throughout, throughout the night uh, is a pretty typical flight duration for these insects. Uh, they will travel, you know, maybe 200 kilometers or more during that time. So, so these insects, even though they're very, very small bodied, can really travel very long distances because of uh, uh, this strategy of, of getting into these low level jets. So how many insects are up there? Um, I knew there was a lot because I've been doing this aerial sampling for many years and catching lots of insects, but um, even I was surprised uh, when we crunched the numbers and, and figured out just how many there were. And what we found was that the 
the average uh, number of insects uh, flying over southern England uh, across the course of, a, of an average year was somewhere around about three and a half trillion insects. So that's 10 to the 12 or a million, million insects. That's an awful lot of material. Um, it varied a bit from year to year, some years with more uh, than others, uh, somewhere between two and five trillion. Um, and that uh, is basically comprising thousands of tons of biomass. So there's a huge amount of material up there that's uh, moving around. Now, numerically, they're nearly all these micro insects. So they make up, uh, you know, the aphids and the tiny parasitic wasps, they make up more than 99% numerically of all of the insects, right? So the medium and these and larger insects, even though they're, they're, um, they're, they're only make up a, a very small proportion, you know, less than half a percentage, um, actually the numbers are still really big. So we're still talking about billions of insects uh, in these larger size categories. But because they're bigger, obviously they, they make up a, a much bigger contribution to the biomass. So about 20% of the biomass is comprised of these larger insects. So maybe up to about a thousand tons. Most of the insects fly during the daytime. That's the green uh, line on this plot versus the, uh, the blue uh, nighttime uh, line. Um, but what we saw was that um, during some years, the nocturnal uh, insect density really peaked. And that was down to single uh, influxes of very large migratory pest moths, um, this silver wine moth um, that, that would uh, arrive in very large numbers in some years. So what sort of um, patterns did we see in their movement directions? Um, so this is a, a little bit of a, a complicated plot, but I'll, I'll just spend a couple of minutes um, talking through it. Um, so these are circular diagrams that show the directions associated uh, with the migrations. Okay, so how, how these plots work is that um, the little black uh, dots on the outside of the circle, they, that represents one day or night, uh, and it's the direction on that night as if we were plotting it on a compass. And then we are showing, uh, the blue arrows are showing the, um, the, the average direction of movement for the parameter that we're looking at, okay? And then we basically got the three seasons uh, running uh, in, in horizontal lines, spring, summer, and fall. Uh, and the daytime and nighttime uh, data is separated. The first column uh, shows the downwind directions on every single day or every single night. And, you know, in the UK, we have uh, prevailing winds from the southwest. So the average downwind direction tends to be towards the northeast irrespective of what season or what time of day. The other plots show the directions of the mass movements of insects on those, um, in, in those seasons and on those times of day. And the general pattern is that if you look at the spring and the fall, the autumn, the, the, the top line and the, and the bottom line, is that you see this seasonal reversal. So the insects are moving towards the north in the, in the spring and towards the south uh, in the autumn but there's basically a sort of random pattern of movement in midsummer. Uh, and so what that means is that these movements are not uh, random and they're not basically passively downwind because we're seeing very clear seasonal movement, as you might expect, insects moving into the UK in the spring and then moving back out again, or their progeny moving back out again uh, in the autumn. Um, and that means that they must be selecting uh, days or nights that had favorable winds, because if they just migrated on any old day or night, then they would tend to show this pattern of um, being moved towards the northeast, irrespective of season or time of day. But that's not what we see. Um, and so the insects are doing something quite clever. They're selecting uh, days or nights with the seasonally favorable wind and, and moving in that direction. So that means that we have uh, directionality to the transport of this biomass. So there's, as I said, there's thousands of tons of biomass moving around, but it's actually moving in quite predictable directions, okay? So what we decided to do was to see if we had uh, an imbalance. Did we have more biomass coming into the UK, i.e. are we an importer? Or did we have more biomass being exported in the autumn? Are we an exporter of biomass? Or did the flows tend to, to balance out, okay? So this plot uh, shows the net biomass flow with positive values being towards the north 
and negative values being towards the south, right? So that would that means that you would expect the spring uh, data to be on the positive side of the of the zero line, and and you can see the blue line is. So during the spring, we're tending to get positive flows because uh, we're receiving biomass from Europe. During the autumn, the red line, you see uh, obviously that the flow leaving the UK, and so the the value is negative because we're exporting it to the south. But the black line is the average of those two things across the time period. And although there's some variation, some years it's lower, some years it's higher, actually the overall value, the average, is pretty much bang on zero. So we are not a net importer or a net exporter, but we're seeing a massive redistribution of, of biomass and energy and nutrients uh, due to these movements. And these insect movements are huge. So as I say, there, there are you know, uh, thousands of tons of biomass. That includes you know, hundreds of thousands of kilograms of, of um, essential nutrients like nitrogen, for example. And uh, there's a massive amount of energy and, and calories in this, um, in, in this insect movement. Now, I'm not going to uh, suggest that, that, we, that we start eating these insects, but you know, if, if we were, uh, we could feed a, a town of 20,000, like Falmouth, where I live, for two months, uh, based on the, the calorific input from those insects. So, of course, they're having really, really significant effects on ecosystem functioning and so on. Okay. And so I'm just going to uh, now talk for a few minutes about some of the, these ecological consequences of these migrations. Okay. So you can, you can think about the impact that uh, animal migrations have uh, on, on, on ecosystems um, in, in two ways. There's the, the transport effect, so the, the actual movement of material due to the migrants moving from A to B, and then from B back to A. Um, and then there are also the, what you could call the trophic effects or the, the, the food web effects. So when uh, you know, a herbivore or a predator or a prey item, whatever the migrant happens to be, enters a new ecosystem, you know, what effect does it have on, on that ecosystem? And what effect does it have when it, when it leaves, for example? Um, and so in terms of the transport effects, um, the migrants uh, move themselves, their bodies, that, that includes nutrients and energy, uh, and we just talked a little bit about that. The migrants might also be carrying uh, uh, propagules, i.e. you know, uh, seeds or pollen uh, on their bodies, uh, because maybe they, you know, they've been visiting flowers, for example, and so they might be having a very important role in, in transferring eggs and, and pollen and seeds around. And of course, they might also be um, transmitting diseases and carrying pathogens and parasites. Um, avian influenza is, a, is a, an example that I'm sure you, you've all heard of. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement of, of the propagules, uh, the pollination effect. And then uh, in terms of the trophic effects, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the influx of predators and, and, and how that uh, can affect ecosystems. And I'm going to do that with the same uh, study organism, uh, the hoverfly, uh, which um, we've been working on recently. So um, these uh, beautiful insects, uh, the marmalade hoverfly, um, is a, a very uh, common uh, long range migrant. And uh, we did a similar study uh, that I've just shown you, but this time focusing just on this one species. And what we found was that um, during the, uh, the, the spring uh, immigration of this species, we could have about 500 million of them arrive in the UK and uh, about 2 billion of them will depart uh, later in the autumn. Okay. And hoverflies do two really uh, key um, ecosystem services. The first one is a service that's provided by the adults and that's that they are extremely good pollinators because the adult flies um, eat pollen and nectar and they're very frequent uh, flower visitors. They need to eat a lot of pollen and nectar to power those journeys. And so they visit flowers all along their migrations. And what we found was that um, every individual migratory fly as it came into the UK from Europe, and also when they left the UK to go back to Europe, were on average carrying 10 uh, pollen grains uh, from a variety of different flowers on their body. Okay. And so these um, millions of, of hoverflies, these hundreds of millions of hoverflies that are entering and departing uh, the UK are obviously transporting billions of pollen grains back and forth between the UK and Europe. And so that has 
there's really important consequences for, for pollination ecology and the population dynamics of the plants which they are cross-pollinating uh, across continental borders. Uh, so the plants themselves can't move, but the hoverflies are being this agent of, of um, uh, gene, ex gene exchange across uh, long distances. Okay. When these hoverflies are in the UK, they're also obviously continuing to visit flowers and, and making lots of um, pollination visits. So in addition to that long range uh, gene exchange, they're also just providing an extremely good pollination service for our um, wildflowers and for our flowering crops. Okay. And what we found was that looking into the numbers involved in these movements, we, we could see that this, this one species of migratory hoverfly um, was so abundant that actually in many times of the year, it was more abundant than all of the managed honeybees that were present in the UK. And as I said, each adult fly will make hundreds of um, flower visits. And so, you know, they're obviously incredibly important uh, components of our pollinator community. I'm sure that you have heard uh, stories in the press about the insect decline and our, our fears about uh, pollinators in particular declining and, and we're losing that valuable ecosystem service. And so it seems that this migratory species, who's you know, uh, in, in a good news, a rare good news story, uh, is actually maintaining its population at stable level and is incredibly abundant, uh, unlike most other pollinators, uh, is continuing to um, provide very valuable services. And um, somebody who wrote a, a popular science article about our paper titled it um, pollination services helicoptered in uh, to give the impression that um, we're receiving this very nice sort of benefit from from this natural immigration that's coming uh, from the continent. Um, the second ecosystem service that these hoverflies provide is that the the maggots of the flies uh, feed on pest aphids. Okay, and as part of this study, what we did was we calculated how many pest aphids would be eaten by the progeny of the hoverflies that arrive in the UK each spring, all right? And uh, the maths that we used uh, is summarized on this slide. And what, what we found was um, that uh, each uh, larva uh, of, of, of the hoverfly will eat about 400 aphids if it survives to become another adult, okay? And each female hoverfly uh, will lay about um, 400 eggs. Okay, so you can see that, that very quickly from those, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of migratory hoverflies arriving in the UK, you can see that you're going to very, very quickly get to extremely high numbers of aphids. Um, when, when we finished crunching our numbers, we found that um, in, in a good year, uh, these hoverflies could eat up to um, 10 trillion aphids across the UK. And that worked out at about a million aphids per hectare of crops. Okay, so um, Richard will might be able to comment on this, but we, we figured that that was about um, a fifth of the typical number of aphids that you would expect in crops. And so, you know, these ho these hoverflies, in, in addition to these wonderful pollination services, are also helicoptering in a really good pest suppression uh, service uh, for for our ag agriculture. Okay, and of course. All of these um, hoverflies, the adults and their maggots, are also uh, quite important food items for, for higher trophic levels. So our native songbirds, uh, insect, other insectivorous mammals and so on, will be relying on these, um, uh, these very large numbers of insects that are arriving. And so they're providing an extremely critical role uh, in our ecosystems. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to uh, finish uh, very quickly by mentioning um, some work that we are now doing to try to expand our studies to, to the larger scale, to do continental level scale um, studies. Because as I mentioned earlier on, uh, weather radars, which are also actually really good at detecting insects and birds, um, now exist in very large networks across um, continents. Um, here's a, an illustration of uh, weather radars that we were able to get um, data from, uh, from across Western Europe. And in a study that we um, did uh, to study bird migration, we were able to do um, th these, these very large scale, uh, continental scale um, studies of bird migration. And, and what this plot shows is um, a month of averaged uh, nocturnal songbird migration intensity across all of those weather radars uh, with 
the size and intensity of the color of the circle at each location, uh, giving you information about um, the migration traffic rate of birds in terms of the, the numbers passing per kilometer per hour, and the arrows showing the direction of migration. Um, and so you can see that there's a, a very clear movement of birds um, from all over Europe down towards um, the Straits of Gibraltar to, to pass into Africa. And that the, the migration intensity at this particular time was very intense, for example, over, um, over central France and so on. So you can imagine that this kind of information could be extremely useful uh, in terms of trying to conserve birds, you know, figuring out where, where areas that we need to protect, but also in terms of, of, of flight uh, and aviation safety, in terms of trying to figure out you know, where and when uh, aircraft might um, need to be very uh, careful or vigilant or avoid uh, airspace that, that might have a high risk of, of bird collision, for example. And these weather radar networks are found in many parts of the world. So there is the potential here to do truly global studies of, of animal migration. So this, this diagram shows um, the areas that currently have um, their, their airspace uh, under surveillance from, from weather radar networks, so all of those areas that are colored. And so you can see that, for example, across uh, much of um, uh, the, the Americas and, and Europe, and then across into East Asia and uh, down through into Australasia, for example, that there is um, very good coverage, uh, although it's much more patchy in, in other regions. And so, um, you know, with lots and lots of colleagues, uh, the, these are things that we are now trying to work on is um, building to a point where we will be able to, to carry out coordinated um, you know, atmospheric studies of, of migration and tra uh, migration traffic rates and intensities at, at truly global scales. Okay, so um, I, I hope I've managed to convince you uh, in this this um, talk about the importance of insect migration and, and why it's important uh, to study it. Um, and we've seen that, you know, that even though these insects are flying uh, high above the ground and that therefore their movements are determined by the wind, it's still actually a role for, for the flight behavior because the insects are able to select favorable tailwinds so that they can travel uh, great distances in seasonally beneficial directions. And that it's important for us to, you know, even though it's difficult and challenging, it is important for us to develop uh, techniques that allow us to monitor these movements so that we can predict and forecast uh, their movements so that we can try to, as, uh, as Richard always says, you know, try to get more of the things that we like and, and less of the things that we, that we don't like. So um, I'd just like to finish by um, thanking uh, some of my colleagues who are, who've worked with me over the years, particularly uh, colleagues at, at Rothamsted who, uh, who, who are really instrumental in getting this work up and running and, and developing the radar systems. And then some, uh, some of my collaborators at various places around the world who, who have, um, uh, I've done this research with. And, and uh, in particular, uh, Rothamsted and BBSRC um, for funding the work. Um, and then, yeah, finally, just to thank, you know, the organisers of the, both the Royal Entsoc and the Royal Aeronautical Society uh, for this invitation to, to speak to you all. Thank you. Jason, absolutely great. Thank you very, very much. Terrific to hear uh, an update on your uh, amazing work. I retired seven years ago and I'm not up to date at the moment, but I'm a lot more up to date now. So thank you. And I'm also delighted that AFID's feature uh, strongly in there and that you're going to sort out or your um, friends up there are going to sort out all our aged problems we can perhaps discuss that I can see a paper coming if it's not out already um, so what we're going to do now uh, is three things in in the next 10 minutes um, Bianca is going to put up a, a poll with a few simple questions on that we'd like you all to answer uh, there will also be a follow-up questionnaire on this meeting that will delve a little bit deeper, I think, into um, how you would like to develop uh, collaborations between the two societies. But do answer the, the poll questions first, and then please, if you could feed back when uh, that uh, questionnaire comes to you, that would be great. So in the next 10 minutes, please just answer the poll questions. 
Um, I've seen lots of questions coming in on the chat. Um, a quick scan suggests to me that at the moment, Jason has rather more questions than Di. So also in the next 10 minutes, please think about any other questions that you would like asked and put them into, uh, into the chat. Um, and then also use the next 10 minutes for a, a comfort break if you wish. Uh, my big request is please do all of those things, but don't go away. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, we'll resume chatting in 10 minutes after you've dealt with the poll, had a comfort break and asked a few more questions. Okay, so thank you very much.
Okay, everybody, I think we've just about had our 10 minutes. The numbers haven't dropped off too badly, so uh, thank you for staying. And, and, and apologies, it seems as though the poll disappeared about uh, or, or, or seized up about halfway through that uh, break. So at the end of the meeting, I think the anchor will be able to tell us uh, the results of the poll as far as it's gone. But the questions will be repeated in the questionnaire that's going to come around uh, requesting feedback for the meeting. So um, if you could sort of re-answer the poll questions then, uh, that would be that would be really great. Um, so um, we have got uh, a, a, a Bianca says she's going to share the results now. Yes, could could you do that then, Bianca, please? Sorry, you should be able to see them now. I can't at the moment. If you click on polls. Ah, ah polls, yes, there we are. Okay. Well, let me just read through. So um, the first question, would you like current talk topics on insects and aircrafts expanded to a full conference? Um, out of those who have who, who managed to respond before the poll disappeared, there's an overwhelming support for that concept, which is great, which means we can uh, explore that further. Uh, would you like to examine interactions between aircraft and other wildlife, such as birds and bats? Again, uh, a, a large proportion in favour of doing that. Would you like to examine uh, biomimicry applied to aircraft design? In other words, uh, some of you may not have understood that question, but uh, that is going to be all about what uh, insects can potentially uh, teach us uh, as far as aircraft design is concerned. <laughs> the options there were yes and yes, but I presume that everybody realized that the second part of that was no. Uh, but again, uh, overwhelming support for exploring that further. And question four, it does look as though a few people have got some other suggestions for potential future collaboration. So please do uh, feed those through uh, with the feedback. That would be great. So let's move on to questions then. Um, Bianca, did you manage to uh, get them all together into a single file or do I go back to the start I'll go back to the start and work through but what I'd like to do is to uh, use the uh, chair's prerogative and, and, and ask a, a first question uh, to uh, die uh, now this I, I think I think the people in the two societies probably fear asking naive questions to the other organization and, 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 and my one comes under that uh, category but when I look at aircraft again when I'm boarding I shall look at what's sticking out of them with renewed interest now and, 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 and new knowledge but with the pitot tubes is it uh, too naive to ask whether instead of blocking them up and then unblocking them before an aircraft flies, is there any possibility of covering them with uh, a fine uh, mesh that would stop any insects getting in, or would that interfere with the operation of the pitot tube too much? Yeah, it, um, it would get in the way. Uh, you, you can do it with large engines, so you, you'll see some of the the helicopters that operate in the Gulf, for example, will have sand filters installed, but um, that that comes at a cost in performance, which is the last thing you need in the Middle East, uh, because the hotter it is, the uh, the less lift you get. So it's um, in, in practice, it's about the mitigations will be about managing the habitats, uh, particularly for um, some of the insects that have been identified um, at Heathrow, for example, and uh, the the other bit is the processes, which says you um, you're going to put these covers on. You might actually start to work on easier ways to fit them, but um, there'll be there'll be uh, strengthened procedures to make sure they don't get missed. Uh, having said that, you know there are strengthened procedures to stop people getting airborne with 
uh, locking pins in the undercarriage, but they still managed to do that. <laughs> uh, while while I've got the mic though, and 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 something for Jason to think about um, before you get to his questions is uh, I was intrigued by the 600 meter bandwidth. So uh, uh, 600 meters in my language is 2,000 feet, and 2,000 feet uh, is a, a region where the uh, the effects of surface friction on the airflow uh, reduce to it's fairly constant thereafter. So the 2,000 foot wind uh, in the northern hemisphere, certainly it's obviously in the other direction in the south, is half the strength of the wind at the surface. Sorry, is double the strength of the wind at the surface. So 10 knots on the surface, 20 knots at 2,000 feet, and it's always in a slightly different direction. So it's always veered by about 30 degrees. Um, clearly, that changes as you get um, different wind strengths. So it, it's good for 10 knots and above. If you've got really light winds, it's not quite so um, stark. But um, how marvelous that insects knew that, and they're using the strongest wind by going up to 2,000 feet. That's astonishing. Indeed. Did you want to comment on that, Jason, or? Um, yeah, yeah, no, okay, uh, thanks. So, yeah, that's very interesting to hear that. Um, yeah, it, it is, in some ways, it's astonishing that insects are doing this, but I guess in other ways, it, it's not. I mean, every time, I'm sure Richard feels the same, every time we're sort of flabbergasted by some, you know, amazing new thing that insects are doing, you just pause for a moment, you think, well, they have actually had 400 million years of evolution to fine tune their capabilities, and that they're extremely good at, at sensing their environment so you know it, insects are covered in incredibly sensitive wind detecting organs you know the, the hairs uh, the the cilia all over their body um and so yeah i think they're just you know they're really fine-tuned to these and they just have this amazing capability to do that um and yeah but the, yeah they're really they're really good at it yeah hmm. Jason, may i ask um just comment on that um <clears throat> We've been talking about the aerodynamics of insects at that altitude, but um, they must have to cope with cold and um, destructive forces on their bodies as well. Have you had a, maybe, can you give us some thoughts on that? Yeah, so the temperature thing is, is interesting because yeah, as, as you know, insects are, are cold-blooded and, and restricted by uh, air temperature uh, as to, you know, they can only be active at, at certain temperatures. And most of the insects that we see in the UK that migrate can't really fly at air temperatures below about 12, 13 degrees C, right? But but in, in these low level jets that happen at night, um, not only is the wind uh, decoupled fr from the ground and, it, and it's faster, but it's also the warm air that's risen up, uh, you know, that was heated up during the day and is now rising in the nighttime. So it's actually usually warmer up there than it is at ground level. So, you know, we, we've, we've taken, um, uh, air temperature readings by putting balloons up and you see that you know it might be only 10 12 degrees at midnight at ground level but at 600 meters it might be 14 16 18 degrees c so the insects are in these layers which are allowing them to stay active longer than they would be if they were flying closer to the ground so there's actually two benefits for them going into those into those layers at night the wind is faster so they're getting more more um, energetic support but it's also warmer so they can fly for longer. And the forces on their wings, do they close their wings or do they uh, flap less? Have you uh, looked into that? Yeah, no, so they have to, so they have to keep flying. If, if, so if the, even quite small insects, if they stop flapping their wings, um, irrespective of how fast the, you know, the horizontal wind speed is, they will basically gradually fall out of the, the sky. Uh, and we don't see that, we see them maintaining you know, steady altitude, and actually the radar signals also provide wing beating uh, information, and we see that they're they're flapping their wings um, at, at a constant uh, rate, uh, and so so they have to keep flying. So so the, these flights are still energetically expensive for them, um, but they they don't seem to be damaged. I mean, we've done a lot of aerial sampling. I showed in the talk. You know, we we caught the insects uh, in balloons, and we bring them down, and they're you know. They're, they're absolutely fine. They don't. They're not damaged. They're they're perfectly viable. People have done experiments where they've you know because 
when this was first discovered, you know, people said, ah, oh, but those insects will be dead or they'll be inviable or they won't be able to lay eggs. And, and actually the experiment showed that, no, they're perfectly fine. They can mate, they can lay eggs, they can, they can do everything. Uh, and they don't seem to be damaged at all. So, um, you know, again, they just, they, they've, they've evolved to cope with, with these challenging environments and, uh, and are perfectly able to do that. It's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move through some of the questions in the chat. And I've got one here. Uh, it's for Di, but I'm not really quite sure it's Di's remit, but you may well be able to comment. Uh, from Linda Ofoka, who is um, curious to know whether there are challenges with insects in the aircraft cabin. Um, you know, mosquitoes, for example, bed bugs, even she mentions, um, and whether there are any sort of active control measures going on routinely or otherwise to deal with that problem. Not perhaps such a safety thing, but uh, more a comfort thing. Yeah, so um, th there are rules. Uh, it won't surprise you. Uh, bed bugs have been uh, materializing in the last uh, few years, um, which probably says more about society in general, uh, because I know they're more certainly more prevalent in London than they used to be. So um, the mosquitoes and other um, flying insects, the uh, ICAO and the World Health Organization um, recommend, I mean, for ICAO, that's a pretty strong recommendation. Uh, you are expected to, uh, to use an insecticide in the cabin, uh, and they do that at three points, typically, uh, when the doors are closed, so they will go through and that will knock down any um, insect which takes out the um, typical things like mosquitoes, you know, where, they're, where they are disease vectors, certainly. Uh, they will do that afterwards. And there is also, uh, there will be treatments with longer acting insecticides that will lie on the surfaces and, and get to them that way. Uh, the, the idea being, I mean, biosecurity generally, but that you're not going to be bringing into the UK a, um, uh, an insect from Australia that's gonna cause us problems here. Sure. So, so if it's long haul, you won't see it so much on short haul, but if it's long haul, you're crossing continents, you are pretty guaranteed, much guaranteed to have somebody walk through and, and you've probably been on those flights where some nice person walks to the front and the back with the two aerosols giving it what for. Thank you. And of course, Jason has uh, shown that it's quite possible that um, uh, alien insects get in uh, via their own long distance uh, transport. And I did see a question coming up on that. We'll save that uh, for a little bit later. Um, I think the question from Monica about um, uh, insects uh, using uh, thermals and currents has already been answered. I think she asked the question before Jason went into that, so we'll pass by that. And there's a very specific question from Peter Merritt. Um, I don't know whether you know the answer to this one, uh, Jason. How mm. migratory is Spodoptera frugiperda compared to the African armyworm Spodoptera exempta? Uh, yeah, so I, I've, got, I've got a little bit of experience on work, with working with um, uh, the fall armyworm, Frugipeda, although I've never worked with Exempta. But it, it, I think they're, they're basically both highly migratory. So um, Spiroptera Frugipeda, you know, you may well know if you've asked the question, you presumably quite, you know, already quite know the story quite well. But it, the fall armyworm is this moth which um, is a native to the Americas. And is highly migratory there, so it, it, it expands um, from its subtropical winter breeding grounds in places like uh, the, you know, the sort of Rio Grande, uh, Texas, Mexico border, all the way through the U.S. up to Canada, and then retreats again the following autumn. So a very, you know, very long-range migrant, um, and it got accidentally imported into Africa, and then within a space of um, about eighteen months from first being detected in West Africa. It, it had reached every corner of, of the continent and was causing massive pest problems everywhere. It then jumped from Africa to India, probably again by, by human aided transport. Uh, but then once it got to India, it spread from India into Southeast Asia and then into China and then reached Japan and Korea. So, I mean, incredible, you know, an incredibly migratory species. Uh, African armyworm, I don't know so well, but I know that that's also capable of, of these very long range movements and can move from, from its Central African breeding grounds to the South Africa and North Africa in the case uh, space of a year. So I would imagine that they're pretty 
pretty similar. I, I would say they were they were neck and neck in their migratory capabilities. Both um, very very uh, uh, you know important species economically. Um, they, they can cause huge pest problems. And, and poor old Africa, you know, already had its own Africa. It already had its own army worm, uh, and then uh, sadly now it's got this American version as well that's uh, joined in. So that's you know, just kind of adding to the pest control problems. Um, yeah, I'm curious okay. if, if Peter had a you know sort of follow up comment. Perhaps he knows a little, a little more about it. I'd you know be happy to hear. Um, Great. So perhaps Peter could uh, get in touch with you, Jason, if, if, if he wants to know a little bit more. That would be that be super. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another one for you, a, little, a, a technical one again from uh, Linda, um, who's interested in your flight altitude charts um, and wants to know whether that particular type of chart has a name and what the software, what software ah, you to develop yeah. it. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, um, I <laughs> Sadly, I can't make those plots myself. I, although I've um, worked in this area for a long time, I've always relied on colleagues who are much more sort of technically gifted to produce the nice graphics and so on. I, I like to think of myself as the sort of ideas man and um, other people actually do a lot of the work. And that, that was a PhD student of mine, uh, Curtis Wood, uh, who, who, who plotted those very nice plots. Uh, and he, it, the software he was using was MATLAB. Um, I don't know that the, the that chart has a you know a specific name uh, I was I, I'm not sure that anybody else was using MATLAB to do that we're probably the only people who produce plots like that um, but uh, yeah so that was the software that was used to do it and um, they're very nice and I, I wish I could do them myself but it's beyond yeah. my capability yeah. I'm afraid and I'm too old to learn it now. <laughs> uh, the next question is, in a way, slightly similar. It involves uh, one of the, uh, the the plots. This time, the um, uh, the diurnal patterns. Um, and Claire Montgomery says that the Earth's atmosphere atmospheric potential gradient is strongest in the early evening. Electric fields have been shown to elicit ballooning in spiders. Uh, push it, it pushes them upwards. Um, could the atmospheric potential gradient be causing a mass movement of insects upwards in the early evening? Okay, yeah, in interesting suggestion. So I, I know that um, so the, the work that was done on, on, on spiders was actually, you know, done by a, a colleague of Richard and I, I was at Rotham said, Andy Reynolds, who showed that these very small uh, uh, ballooning arthropods, non, non, you know, arthropods that can't fly, uh, can use things like electrostatic potential and they release these silk threads and, and they get um, uh, s some assistance in, in their climbing. And there are lots of very small insects that, that do similar things. So there are a lot. So surprisingly, when we, we've done our aerial netting samples, there's a lot of stuff in the nets that don't fly. And, you know, initially we were like, oh, we must be, you know, somehow sampling the ground insects uh, by accident. But you know, this happened again and again, however careful we, we were to do it. And it turns out that there are lots of flightless arthropods, very tiny organisms that get up into the sky. Um, and they do this, uh, you know, by a variety of means, uh, including the, the mechanism mentioned there. So I think that's true for some of the smaller insects. The bigger things, though, you know, the, the, the insects that I've studied more often, the things like the, the dragon, dragonflies, butterflies and moths, um, they're basically climbing purely from their own own powered uh, flight. And you, you see this when, when they take off, they actually climb, they do this kind of classic spiral in flight and they climb very quickly of the order of, uh, you know, a couple of meters per second. Um, and so I don't think that that, that would be important for these insects. They, they, their body mass would be much too great to be assisted by that. Um, and these larger insects typically fly at night when there isn't much in the way of thermal convection either. So they, they're relying on their own uh, climbing the capabilities to get up there but um yeah it's an interesting suggestion and I, i'm sure it's very important for the the very tiny insects and and uh balloon inspired buildings and so on lovely thank you we're still with you jason i want to climate change now but i'm going to move straight to uh, the part of the question that is uh, more in your remit than the, the, the mine and uh that is uh, will the changing weather potentially disrupt migration routes? This is from Vicky Rose. Yeah, I, I mean, un undoubtedly so. The, the challenge is to, you know, come up with a sort of short answer as to how it will change, because I, I'm often asked this question, and, and the simple answer is we, we don't know the specifics, but, you know, undoubtedly things will change. What, what, what we're seeing, I would say, that uh, it, it, over the last 20 years, 
the number of new immigrant species of insects that are being detected in the UK and colonizing uh, for the first time is growing very, very rapidly. So um, we are seeing um, a, a huge sort of turnover in our uh, entomological fauna and, and lots and lots of new colonists arriving all the time. Uh, and so at, at that large scale, climate change is definitely helping lots of these insects move north and, and colonize. In terms of what, what we might expect in, in, in terms of um, migration patterns, I think that's really challenging because the, the, obviously the temperature is not the only factor here. It will depend on things like the, the wind patterns and so on. And while you can find really nice, simple explanations in the literature about what we expect temperature to do, it's much more challenging trying to find predictions of what will happen to you know, pr prevailing wind directions and, and wind speeds and so on. So I, yeah, I don't know, the, the simple answer is, yes, it will change, but I how it will change. And it will be very interesting to, to see that over the, the coming decades. Okay, fine. Um, another one for you, then one for Di. Um, uh, it, this is from Alex Wood, and it's about um, your your uh, net trapping. Um, how do you calibrate measurements of biomass? You mentioned high altitude nets, but how do you estimate the proportion of biomass that you've captured? Uh, right, sorry, I didn't I didn't quite catch the question, Richard. Um, okay, so um, with your high altitude nets, you catch. Yeah. Uh, a certain number of insects, but how do you uh, calibrate that? In other words, you know, per unit volume, how, how do you work out, uh, I guess he means per unit volume of air, um, or uh, he, he's asking in terms of the proportion of the biomass that you actually pick up. But okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go, I'll, I'll apologize in, a, in advance if I don't quite answer the question, but I'll, I'll have a go at, at um, explaining a little bit more about what we do and, and hopefully that will will answer the question. So, so when, when, we're, when we're sampling with the net, what we are also able to do is measure the, the amount of um, wind flow that passes through. So we, we know the, the diameter of the net, so we know the surface area that we're sampling. And because then we know that the speed of the wind, we can estimate the volume of air that we sampled. You know, so we get like a, a horizontal column of air. And then from that, we can extract you know, all of the insects that we catch. We, we work out the abundance and we can weigh them and, and work out the biomass. And then we just have to extrapolate from that. So, um, you know, th these, <laughs> these are in some ways rather heroic extrapolations because we're taking a very tiny portion of the atmosphere that we're sampling and then, you know, ex extrapolating that to try and figure out what's happening at the very large scale. But we, we, we believe we're justified in doing that because when you sample high in the sky, it, it doesn't really seem to matter where you put your net. You don't get these local differences. You know, it's, if you move 10 meters to the side, you don't suddenly get lots more or lots fewer insects. The, the, you know, we've shown this uh, very clearly, the density of insects stays consistent of a very, you know, quite wide horizontal extent. So we believe that wherever we put the net, we're, we're, we're getting a true reflection of what's up there. Um, and then we can also, the radar has also given us the, the height, you know, how that varies with altitude. So although we, we've got very precise measurements at particular altitudes where we put our net, we're then able to interpolate that over, over the height range based on, on how the radar density changes with altitude. Um, so, that, so hopefully that sort of at least partly answered um, that question. But um, if it didn't, as Richard said, you know, do drop me a line and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be more precise. Okay, thanks, Jason. Back to you in a minute, but over to, to Di now. And a question from uh, Gia Aradotia, um, who is the treasurer of the Royal Entomological Society. And, and, and her question, I think, in, in, in some way uh, reflects that because she wants to know whether, in addition to the uh, performance and safety aspects of um, surface uh, disruption from insect detritus, are there issues in relation to add to fuel consumption and cost? Uh, absolutely, there are. The, um, uh, and all that form of, of drag is called parasitic drag. Um, it, you, have to, you can only overcome it with thrust. So you have to burn fuel. Hmm. Uh, and it's as simple as that. So uh, all those little irregularities um, stack up, which is why you will see all modern aircraft being built with flush headed rivets, whereas the old ones weren't. Uh, it's less of an effect on a ship and more difficult to do that with heavy steel plates. So 
they use the traditional riveting uh, or welding, uh, whereas with aircraft, you, you want it as, uh, as clean as possible. So um, you, you will always see those fasteners below the surface for just that reason. So as smooth as possible. So yes, um, it, does, it does make a difference. And the, I was given, just to put it in perspective, uh, that, that sort of parasitic drag, in other words, the stuff that's not helping you uh, in terms of generating lift. The Typhoon, the RAF's um, main fighter aircraft, uh, built at Wharton, and they use laser jigging, which adjusts for um, the movement of the tides as well. It's that accurate. If they use the full tolerance, which is about a three centimeter bend between one end of the fuselage and the other of quite a long airplane, uh, that will add about 10% to the through life fuel consumption of that aircraft. So all those things add up and, and it's in everybody's interest to, um, to get it right. Uh, so, which is why NASA is looking at things like these um, coatings that will re re um, reduce the, uh, I think they've had up to 40% so far reduction in, in insect residue. Okay, thank you. I'm skipping through now. We're getting close to the time that we uh, said that we'd uh, finish. So I'm just going to um, so eyeball these questions, pick out one or two more. Um, uh, does This is from Sohail. Uh, does Di think that uh, onboard aircraft weather radar could be used to monitor insect swarms um, and even be resolved to individual insects? I think, can I add to that and say, you know, is there any prospect of um, forecasting or monitoring where insects are like, especially locusts, which tend to sort of convert, uh, sort of gather in convergent airstreams. Do you think there's any possibility of being able to record where these are in time to do something about it, take avoiding I, action, change your level? Yeah, I, I think if you could accurately predict where locusts were going to swarm and when, you'd be quite rich. Yeah. Um, mm. So uh, on, the, uh, on the radar side, uh, the, uh, we're, we're talking the wrong frequencies. So for very small, the, basically the smaller the target, the higher the frequency and the shorter the wavelength you need to get um, a, a return that will discriminate um, on, on another airborne target. So uh, there are questions about the power output and certainly the range that you do that. So by and large, if you you could have that as an antenna, which would be able to do both, you'd be able to have to generate both both waveforms, uh, they tend to be slightly different, but you could only do that at the expense of taking away from the, the normal function of those radars, which is weather avoidance um, and anti-collision. So I suspect the answer is, it would be lovely, but, but you'd probably have to have a separate sensor and, um, and that's gonna be as a fuel penalty. Excellent, okay, thank you. Okay, um, it is just about time to finish. I'm just gonna ask one more question. This one comes from Fran Sconce, uh, a member of staff of our society. Um, uh, a, a very interesting question. Do small drone aircraft also have issues with insects? I, I think the, um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think they, they are less prone to it because they're not so fast moving and they tend to be operating in the lower levels. The small ones, uh, the larger ones, of course, have got very different propulsion systems. Uh, but you still have all the same issues with things like sensing. For uh, certainly, the, as the larger drones, we talk about urban air mobility now. Uh, those will also have some form of airspeed sensing, and now you can do that with inertial platforms. And and it's perhaps likely to go that way rather than pure um, pitostatics. But um, uh, they're still going to get in. You know, you're still going to get the little crawling insects um, going into electronic systems. You're still going to get the um, uh, flies going into heating ducts. And I saw that question from Peter about, you know, why you spray, spray when the outside air is, is at zero? And the answer is because some of them will have migrated um, to those parts of the aircraft where it's not at zero. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's... Uh, I, th I think for, for you entomologists, you will appreciate that um, as the world comes to an end, it's the insects will be the only thing that's left. 
in some, some shape or form. So they're certainly going to outlast aviation uh, in its current guise. Okay, well, on that uh, note of optimism or not, <laughs> um, I, I, I'd like to thank uh, both speakers, hugely, absolutely fascinating and beautifully complimentary talks there. Um, thanks for answering the questions too. Thanks for asking the questions and apologies to those that I skipped over uh, in the interests of time. Hopefully, uh, Jason and I, if you've got any more burning uh, questions, would be willing to uh, would be willing for you to contact them uh, with those questions. But that was truly terrific. So thank you very very much indeed. And I'm going to hand over to Hale for some concluding comments. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> I'd just like to second uh, your, your uh, thank you to um, Jason and Guy. It was fascinating. Um, just to close um, now, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the, the phrase, the statement of the evening was um, Jason, uh, marmalade hoverfly pollination services being helicoptered in. I think that captured everything about this talk today um, in all respects. Um, and, and that highlights the importance of uh, the work that he's doing in, in tracking migration um, of, of uh, that hoverfly uh, to the UK economy and, and the farming sector in particular. Um, and and the, the, the general um, interest of aviation uh, to that work that he's doing is the relevance of uh, size of insect at heights. Um, and that, that's gonna be important. Um, it's important with full size aircraft, but with the smaller air vehicles that I think Di just mentioned um, uh, towards the end, um, and the questionnaire mentioned about small drones. Um, just drones are getting smaller and smaller and they're becoming autonomous. So um, they're gonna be hitting small insects at the same scale size pretty, pretty soon. And then there are drones the size of insects now. Um, so we are talking comparable sizes. Um, in terms of biomimetics, um, there was an interest in the survey expressed in um, uh, going forward with that topic. And biomimetics um, is basically mimicry um, of biological organisms. And at insect scales, aviation is interested in how um, uh, insects have solved many of the problems that aviation also faces. Um, I, I just mentioned um, how insects fold their wings uh, beetles fold their wings within their um, carcass. Uh, we're interested in uh, the flight of insects, um, the aerodynamics of insects. Um, I think Richard mentioned um, what insects can teach uh, um, aviation, but it's also the other way. Um, Dye's um, uh, graphics of uh, how flight, uh, the equations of flight, I, I, I think um, is being studied. Um, uh, in terms of uh, understanding how insects fly. And it's a cross-pollination between the two subjects. Uh, we may explore that in future as well. Um, I think one other thing that probably uh, uh, will be of interest going forward is the trophic effects that uh, Jason mentioned, the predator-prey relationship um, between um, uh, different insect species. Where there are insects, there will be birds, and uh, airports are very concerned with birds. Um, and so tracking of uh, uh, insect uh, patterns uh, and bird patterns in and around airport areas is very important. And we'll be exploring that. Um, so, I mean, one, one question I did have, um, and we may save that for a future um, uh, 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 event. Can you tag individual insects? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe now uh, is, is time. Is there time to ask you, Jason? We, we, what, what's this space? We have a paper coming out in a few weeks in science tracking hawk moths. Please comment on that when you we invite. The very biggest okay. insects can now take the very smallest tags. So, Excellent. Yeah, it's exciting times. Yeah, indeed. So with that, um, I'd like to thank our speakers, um, Jason. Thank you very much. Di, thank you very much. We really appreciate the time and the interest in the subject matter that you covered. Um, I'd like to thank my co-chair, Richard. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you over the past year, um, uh, planning for this talk. I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, the staff, uh, the conference staff at the Royal Entomological Society.
uh, for uh, planning this talk and helping me uh, get through it. And indeed, I'd also last, uh, like to um, thank uh, Keely, our Royal Aeronautical Society Conference's uh, manager, for uh, helping also with, uh, with, with uh, planning for this. Um, finally, I'd like to thank the audience uh, for, for uh, staying with us for the two and a bit hours. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you back again uh, at a future event. Uh, and we look forward uh, to that very much. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Of course, the only person who's not been thanked in all of that is Sohail. So let me, on behalf of the Royal Entomological Society, thank him. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure working with you. I really do hope that this is the start of something and we can uh, look at the feedback afterwards and uh, chart a way forward uh, from there. So many thanks everybody. And just for speakers and organizers, um, if you want to have a sort of post meeting brief chat, I think the anchor is going to send us uh, a separate link. And if you want to spend five minutes just um, running through, then, then that would be great. But very many thanks to everybody and we hope to see you again.